Please join me in giving Jim Carlson a warm Pachyderm Club welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you for having me back at the Pachyderm Club. I have to say this is one of my favorite venues to speak. And one of the reasons is because it's one of the few times that Carl Peter John has to sit and listen. Um, I'm, I'm, here, I'm here on my own behalf, uh, maybe just a little bit of backstory to, to draw this out. Um, we, Stillwater Technical Solutions is a policy strategy firm and one of our one of the things we do that's very unique not only in Kansas but across America is we study the the law the the, the statutory law the congressional records the uh, American Procedures Act requirements and then we apply them to administrative government and it's works we have a, we have about 10 win wins and we've changed decision making in federal agencies and, and particularly on public lands and in Bureau of Land Management. So it works very well and so it's, it's a lot of work and so that had that has in a s landed me an opportunity to work with our former Attorney General Phil Klein. And there we got I got an invita an all expense paid in invitation to wor to work five weeks in Washington D.C. with Phil as an advisor to the Amistad project, and so I'm not representing Amistad today. I'm representing Stillwater, but I'm presenting our work, and so I wanted to be be sure and put that put that out there. Um, it was extremely intense. We were we were out for f we were working on this for five weeks. Now another thing that I want to share with the group is elections right now is a very, very sensitive and dear topic in, on, t on the hearts of most Americans, right? It, it is, it's, it's really, really close to us. And so I'm going to, um, while I'm going to speak to that and what I'm gonna share has a lot of substance, I'm also going to say that um, Americans have been here before, okay? Not necessarily on elections, but we face difficult issues. And, and American exceptionalism is alive and well. It's coursing through our veins, and we're just facing another issue. That's all it is. I, get, I receive phone calls from a lot of people that know me, and they say, well, Jim, are we losing the republic? And I'll say, well, we've got work to do. But we've had problems before. So grab a corner and start pulling, and let's, 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 um, let's work on the republic. Um, there are some cracks in the foundation, there are some things to be done, but with that exhortation, I, I, I want to share that, that, that hopefully this talk today will give you hope. That's what I really, really want to do, is I want to impart hope to the group and, and to Americans because I'm not at all discouraged. Not at all. I just work harder, I work smarter, and I see, I see where the people that want to work are. They come alongside and we work with who you got, right? Anybody, if, and you don't have to raise your hand, but if we got church men, church men or church women, if you got church folks in here, church folk, uh, is in the church you work with who you got. You don't always have the best talent. You work with who's there. And that's the same, that's the same as true with elections. So you just work with who you got. And so, so here, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start with four topic questions. Okay, and that'll get our, that you probably can't see that in the back, and so I'll read them out to us. But I, there's four topical questions. I'm gonna I'll share them with you, and then I'll work through the talk. And the four questions are: first, was infusion of private funding into local precincts during the 2020 election, general election, legitimate? Was infusion of of private funding into local precincts during the 2020 general election was it legitimate? So private funding into the general election, was it, was it legitimate, right? It certainly wasn't wise, right? But what, so we're asking the question, was it, was it legitimate? The second question we're raising here, and we're gonna talk about is, uh, was the Help America Vote Act, Help America Vote Act is the guiding legislation that, that governs planning and election and electoral processes in states that have adopted, have a plans, which all 50 states have, all right? 
And they do that because there's money attached to it. And Kansas has a, has a HAVA plan. And so was HAVA and CARES funding appropriated from state and federal sources for the general tw for the 2020 general election sufficient so what was public money sufficient for the 2020 election to to um, to carry it out and to fund electoral processes etc and that, so the other side of that question is do we did we need private money okay was the public money sufficient I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that question and then three what, where does the authority to administrate elections in the United States originate and reside? Now this is where the crowd comes in. Where does, where does the authority to administrate elections in the United States originate and reside? It's a state issue, right? It originates in the Constitution of the United States and then, and then, and then Article 1 says it resides at the state level, right? So that's very, very clear. And so, so the, and, and going forward, we have legislation right now in the Congress, right, that should be scary. If you read that legislation, we have, we have legislation out there that should ca be some cause for concern. Now, I don't think it'll move. If it does, I don't think when it gets challenged at the, at the highest court in the land that it'll pass muster, right? I don't think it will. But see, this is the game. Let, let me, I mean, I'm very, when I, I'm very, I'm from Western Kansas, right? And so Western Kansas, we're very direct. We just, that's just what we do. And so I don't think that law will pass muster, but the game that we're talking about here, and I call it a game, it's not a game, it's very serious, but the game is catch me if you can. That's what regulatory agencies do, is we'll make, all, we'll make these rules, we'll make this legislation, we'll do this thing, and we'll see if you can, you can catch me. Right, so that's, that's, that's the, the game, it's not really a game, but I, it's, it's what, 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 it's part of what's happening. Okay, and so it's what we have to address. And now number four, this is a four of four topic questions. So we got, we got four questions. Do structural problems exist with the integrity of the U, U.S. electoral system that require congressional action? Okay, are there structural problems with the uh, integrity of the U.S. electoral system, right? See, the progressives would have us believe that there are structural problems and that we need to be, we need to be very, very afraid and we need to um, have legislation and enact legislation and do all of these things that would change the electoral, the electoral system. And I, I submit to you, I'm going to, see, I'm already answering the questions, right? See, I'm getting, but I'll submit to you that, that, that the integrity of the U.S. electoral system is sound. Right? It needs some attention. We've got to watch out for the people that are, that are, that are trying to um, catch me if you can. But the system's sound. It's a good system. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to, um, that's, that's going to be my theme today. So top line issues. So lots and lots of issues to talk about. I'm not going to talk about the F word, uh, fraud. <laughs> Right. I'm not going to I'm not going to address fraud today because that's not what I'm here to do. What we do, see this is one of the reasons why I shared with, with you that we apply the rules because the rules work. And so when you study the rules and you apply them and especially the congressional record, it's very very powerful and you say no no no, we're not going to move past these rules. We're going to hold you to these rules. And that's what we need to do with our with our um folks that are out of control. We need to study the rules, we need to understand them, and then we need to apply them. Now I know uh, uh, we have a, a judge that, that shared the prayer, appreciated the prayer, Your Honor, and, but right now in my world, courts don't make law. Legislatures do. And so while case law colors the, or informs decisions, I stay with the legislative branch of the house, legislative side of the house, so I, and, and I say that with due respect. But that we stay with law, and we apply it, okay? And so here we have, here's our top line issues. Outworking, uh, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try and leave room for questions, because I, I believe there will be some. And so, <clears throat> um, top line issues, electoral authorities. Um, out, the outworking of what we're seeing here is a, the outworking of a top-down philosophy against a bottom-up system. 
outworking of a top-down philosophy against a bottom-up system. Now, what's, if you think about that, in America we've seen, for decades, we've seen the imposition of top-down philosophies. Why? It's, the, the power has been moved further and further and further away from the people of this country. Why? Because that's what socialism and Marxism does. That's what statism does. It moves the power away from the people. And so what we're experiencing here is merely the outworking of what we've seen over time. We've seen it in our school systems, right? Remember, we used to have a local school board and, and parent PTA and all that when I grew up in the 1960s, right? You had PTA. When parents got excited about something, things changed. And so we're seeing the outwork of a top-down philosophy, and that's and elections are as close to home as it gets. They're administered, admi they're administered at the county level, and we must keep it there. Okay, in injection of private funding at the local level bypassed legislative prerogatives, violated established protocols, and created funding hotspots. During this election, we had private funding that was injected at uh, particular points, and this was all by design, okay? It was by design. We've demonstrated that in our report, right? Every author wants you to read their report, right? And so, so you have to read the report to find out, but the, it fun, private funding was injected at particular hot spots. This was already um, outlined by David Fluff. He was with the Obama administration. I'm going to name names, by the way. I'm going to name names. I'm going to point to people. I'm going to point to systems so that, because that's what we have to do. You know, I have people go, Jim, aren't you concerned? Not really, because the hairs on my head are numbered. You know what I mean? Right? You ever heard that? Yeah. I mean, I, the, I, George Washington used to say, and I am by no means George Washington, but I, I pick good mentors, right? And he used to say, I'm as safe on the battlefield, as, oh no, no, I'm, I'm as safe on the battlefield as I am in bed. Actually, there, that was Stonewall Jackson. But anyway, read good books, <laughs> right? Yeah, they both got shot at. Okay, so um, um, the broader issue is access to and control of state managed information. So if you think it's about elections, it is, but there's a bigger picture here. And the bigger picture is information. The bigger picture is access to information by Alphabet, by Zuckerberg, by Facebook. It's about transfer of information and in particular a state electoral databases. That's what they're interested in. Right? Then you can merge that with photographs and all this other su stuff. And, uh, and we can demonstrate that. Um, here, another top line issue is the authority to administrate elections lies exclusively with the state legislatures who have adopted state uh, Help America voting plans. We've already covered that. Okay? And then here, um, the last one is state HAVA plans. I'm just going to use the acronym HAVA. Right? Now, oh, by the way, HAVA, did anybody know when HAVA came around, when, when it was enacted? Well, it was 2002. It was right after the hanging Chad deal in Florida, right? Remember the old voting machines that generated the punch cards and everything? We never had this problem before, did we? Right? We didn't have this problem before when we had the old voting machines. You know, you know in, in my old elementary school, yeah, they were covered with tarps and they got them out twice a year. And you remember that? They did roll them out and they were local churches the same way. All right. So state HAVA plans contain the requirements and the protocols to ensure security and integrity of voter information system, effective voter affect voter communication, recruit and train poll workers, enact plans to improve voter access, and audit and report HAVA funding expenditures. Okay, so we have a system that was adopted, there's a plan it's in Kansas, it's called the Help America Vote Act plan, and it was adopted by the state legislature. It's supposed to be enacted by the executive branch and then carried down to your local clerks, the, 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 you know, through pr procedures and practices and all that stuff to, to assure that voting is carried out evenly and equitably. Okay, equitably. Now we're, that's that's a key word here. So, and you definitely can't see that because I can't see it either. So, let's go to you. You should have a handout. Does everybody have a little handout, handy dandy little handout here? Okay, eleven by seventeen. All right. Now this this puppy got attention, and that's the reason it did. I, I mean, yeah. I I, I got um, I got phone calls from. I mean, this is really neat, right? So I, but I got phone calls from Dinesh D'Souza. 
I, I had an interview on Newsmax. I mean, uh, Kelly, Greg Kelly. I mean, I, all kinds of stuff, right? And I'm just a regular guy. I'm an RG. I'm regular. I got a behind my name, Jim Carlson, RG, right? Regular guy. So, and, and so here anyway. Th but this chart got attention, and here's why. On the top, if you, if is, does anybody not have it? Okay, good. Um, across the top tier, you will see uh, six foundations, right? Knight Foundation, Mark Zuckerberg, F Priscilla Chan, Skull Foundation, etc. Um, Democracy Fund, remember that, that's eBay. Okay, that's eBay. Um, and so eBay is front and center in putting money into elections and electoral processes to change the way America does things. So every time you, you get on eBay, think about that. Okay, Tides Foundation, 1630 Fund, and Arabella Investors. Now, if you don't know anything about Arabella Investors, uh, start Googling that, okay? And so th those are the foundations. Those are the existing foundations. Some of those can be tra traced back to Russian oligarch money and offshore you know, funding flowing in and all this other stuff that, you know, they, they, I need a tinfoil hat, you know, because they say, well, gosh, Carlson, you, you know, maybe you're doing tinfoil stuff. And we say, well, uh, well let's debate this chart. So I, I open that to, to, you know, if this, I open this for debate, if someone, if, if someone wants to debate the chart, I'm willing to do that across the nation. So that's an open, open, uh, open challenge. Okay, the next tier down, now this is really, really important. The next tier down is you'll see uh, two squares and, and four circles. Now what you have here is a series of nonprofits. This is an apparatus that was put in place intentionally to, to move money around to do to affect certain things, okay? And if if you if you weren't going to sleep tonight, let me help you under let me help you with that. Is it, actually reading the report will help you with that. Okay, but, but but let me share with you. This is the same apparatus that's over in public lands. Okay, so environmental groups. This is the same apparatus, and and uh, that that's over in in public lands that's influencing things there um, and decision making. It's you know. Uh, in public lands, by the way, we're moving towards central land planning. Is that okay? No. Not on my watch, but it is. We're moving towards central land planning. But right here, this this is. And by the way, this isn't the full apparatus of of nonprofits. But let's let's cover it. Um, <clears throat> there's a line here that says government and private sector, and so you see that the squares represent government nonprofits who are influencing government at the highest level. So starting from the left side of the chart, you see ERIC, Electronic Registration Information Center. I'm only going to touch these a little bit, and then uh, I'm going to touch these a little bit just so you get a feel for it, okay? And then you can go study it on your own and read the report. But ERIC should be of concern to people because it's an association that was started up by David Becker, uh, he's a house name. He came from Pew Trust, and then he went over and started CEIR. He's a house name, and he started that as an association of the secretaries of state. The secretaries of state are responsible for administration of elect elections. So what you have is, is, a, is an organization, association, just like many associations. I've, in fact, had started one, and, well, I've started six. But one, the, li the one that's still going is Kansas Natural Resource Coalition, and well, in Kansas Kansas Landfill Association I started that back in 2004. But here, you you um, this association, what it does, what it's designed to do, is to influence secretaries and educate them. Secretaries of state. All right. Now you'll notice here if you get down to the names, you start looking at these names. You got David Becker. I mentioned him, but you also have uh, Megan Wolf. She was with with the Wisconsin WEC uh, Wisconsin Elections Commission, right? She was she was on the WEC for Wisconsin, right? So so follow Megan Wolf um, and and others. Now CMSE is the Center for Secure and Modern Elections. They do policy at the state level, and they 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 their mission in life is to try and influence automatic update of of information, voter information at the United States Post Office. Now that should concern you because right now it, when, you, when you update or change your address, right, you fill out an address change form, you say I'm moving over here. Now the U.S. Postal Service would have to have what? Access to the state database in order to upload that information. Right? That's one. There's, a, there's other reasons not to have the Postal Service involved as well. And it's not their mission. Their administrative mission in life is to do what? Deliver mail. That's it. And uh, last time I checked, they, they need work on that. 
And so, so I mean, but CEIR, now here, here's the CEIR, now this one, this one, CEIR, the Center for Electronic Innovation and Research. You'll, you'll notice that Mr. Becker went over there and started that in, right now, about 2012 was when you started seeing all these nonprofits pop up, right? And, and I, wanna, I wanna speed up and I wanna, because I wanna hit stay highlight, I don't wanna go too, in, too much into detail, but you get the idea, is that CEIR, um, it's voter registration policy at the senior administrative level. Okay, so what you have here is an apparatus. Let me just let me let me back up and just say what you have here is an apparatus that's affecting policy at the state level, at the legislative level, secretaries of state, and it's all by design. Okay, it's a, it, these people go to the meetings. They meet down in Tampa when it, this time of year, and that's not a bad place to be, right? And they sit down and they talk about things and they've got strategies and it's well honed, it's well thought out, and it worked. All right, it worked. Now, <clears throat> if you're gonna go home and do some research, um, go over here to NVHI, that's on the far right hand side, that's National Vote at Home Institute. This is the, this is where your leadership comes from and this is where your leadership, this is your leadership think, central leadership think tank. Okay, NVHI, it's on the right-hand side of your chart, and they, they promote comprehensive at-home voting. Now, in the final analysis, here's the issue. All right, here's the issue that they're trying to affect with respect to elections. Conservatives prefer to vote in person. Progressives prefer to vote by mail. I'm sorry? Yeah, oh, actually, you know, yeah, vote, vote, let's see, what is that, vote, early vote, vote early, vote often, right? And we say that, we say that, and it's funny, and then our heart should ache, all right? Uh, you know, and I get, here's one question I get, now see, I, uh, here's one question I, I receive, is they say, well, Jim, is public, private money into public elections Illegal. Notice I said Ill illegitimate. I didn't say illegal, right? That's for courts to decide. But why is it that we have this problem now and never had it before? It, I postulate that it's because the clerks before and our electoral officials didn't let it happen. They were gatekeepers. And they weren't going to, they, I mean, this is a no-brainer, right? Private money into public elections is a no-brainer, right? And so when I was, at one of my interviews, I don't remember which one, it came up, and, and, and let's see, the, 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 here's, here's the question, okay? Jim Carlson does not have the money to put into um, any election, for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> but so what we have now, if we allow this, we've now allowed the elite to influence our elections. Because I can't do it, and you can't do it, chances are, or th otherwise you wouldn't be here, you'd be in Tampa. <laughs> right? You would. You wouldn't be here. I mean, it's, everything's frozen. So we've now transitioned to an elitist nation. All right, so there's that. You, this chart here is part of the report. You can't read it, but it breaks things down. It names names and it names names and organizations and all kinds of stuff. And, and by the way, we're continuing this work, right? We're continuing this work. And, and uh, if you wish to fund something, fund Thomas More Society, right? TMH, Thomas, you know how they got their start? They got their start defending street preachers on abortion. That's where TMH, I, I love these guys, right? I love these guys. So if you wanna, if you wanna give money, give money to Thomas More Society and some, and, I, and they, they don't even know I said it. So give money to them. All right, but so but the, these little charts in here, these handy dandy little, dandy little charts. And by the way, if you write me or give me your business card, I'll send you a hard copy of this. Um, 
but this this chart right here it says private nonprofit associations involved in elections and it, on the left hand column it has the organization and then the function and so the, the and this is a high level function but you can go to their websites and and so by the way after the, all of this started breaking they started taking stuff off their websites they started pulling things down we also did a timeline and in our research, we dug, went down to the clerk level, the county clerk level, we went down to the county commission level, we pulled all of their grant funding from CTCL, we pulled their minutes, we pulled all of that, and we have a timeline that has hyperlinks. You click on these handy dandy little hyperlink, hyperlinks, and you can go to the contract that was generated. By the way, Sedgwick County received how much? Who knows? How much? 816,000 and some change, right? And, and Sedgwick has to generate a report to CTCL on how they use that money, okay? Now, if you go to the CTLC website, they'll have this whole big laundry list of, Can uh, uh, this is important, they'll have this whole big laundry list of Kansas counties that receive money, right? And they'll say, oh, no, no, we, we shared all of this money with all these other counties, see? And, and um, but what, ha what the difference is, is the timing. If you go back, and that's what our port report outlines, is the strategy they used is they started dumping big money into swing states, uh, uh, Wisconsin, Green Bay, Milwaukee, Racine, in Michigan, you had Detroit, you had um, uh, um, um, cities up there. Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids, yeah. Yeah, a bunch of, but see that this was all very, very choreographed and thought out and David Fluff's book says it. Okay, they told us what they were going to do. Because what they did is they did careful analysis, CTCL, Tiana Epps Johnson, by the way, house name, brilliant, brilliant young lady out of Chicago, and, and she worked for the Obama administration. These people all go back through the progressives, right? President Obama was fascinated by this, uh, this ability. He, this, this, a lot of this came from his desk, or at least with his approval and knowledge, right? I can say that, right? It can, it did. Simple fact, right? It did. I mean, and, and so, um, <clears throat> so, okay, so let's, let's uh, I, wanna, I, wanna, I would like to allow time for questions. And so here's our sound bites and take home messages. All right, here's our sound bites and take home messages. Injection of private funding in the 2020 general election led to electoral, electoral funding hotspots, right? You had money going over here in this spot, and this spot, and this spot that resulted in equ inequitable per voter spending. In Wisconsin, there's places that, that, that CTCL m money went in and it, it amounted to $47 per voter spent when the state HAVA fund, which is supposed to be equitable, had seven. So ten, whatever that number is, I'm not a mathematician. I'm an engineer that couldn't add. And so I wrote my way through <laughs> engineering school. <laughs> yeah, and so, so but, but the point is, is that that's inequitable. That's dis that had a disparate, a disparate impact on the 2020 elections. Number two, the presence of CTLC funding in the 2020 general election bypassed Help America Vote Act funding formulas, training requirements, and many other protocols violating state legislative prerogatives and processes. State legislatures, legislators should be angry. And indeed they were. Do you know, as part of the media blackout, for example, in Mich Michigan, you, Michigan is a house name bad actor. Governor, Secretary, Attorney General. Follow the money. Their house name, let me look at the camera. House name bad actors, right? Do you know that the legislators during this process, you remember uh, uh, during the electoral process, that the Republican legislators were going to meet in the State House in Michigan to debate the, the electoral process and they were locked out by the governor. They were locked out of the state house by the governor of Michigan. That reminds me of the burning of the Rockstag in 19, February of 1934, right? 
If you're going to correct me, be, be, if you're going to correct me, be accurate. It's 34. Okay? So whoever that, whoever that said, said that. Um, <clears throat> so, number three, the combination of the gubernatorial lockdown orders, departure of the, the, the departure of the state secretaries of Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin from state HAVA plans, and infusion of private CTLC funding had a clear, demonstrable, and material impact on the outcome of the 2020 general election. It did. It absolutely did. It and, and that combined with other things that may be forthcoming in other reports will, we'll, um, okay, so thoughts for consideration, then we're gonna take some questions. Uh, here, public appro appropriations for the 2020 general election cycle were sufficient, rendering the need for private funding wholly unnecessary. That private funding was not necessary. There was adequate CARES money. There was adequate HAVA money into state elections. There was plenty of money. And, and CTLC's public narrative was, oh, be scared. Be scared. We don't have enough money. And so we need to give you money, all the, all the clerks. And in reality, there was plenty of public, there was plenty of money. And so somebody's, somebody's wrong, all right? Let's do that. I mean, look at the camera. Somebody is wrong. Somebody's not incorrect. This is all discoverable. That's why it doesn't, that's why they don't attack us. When you stay with the facts and you stay with the statutes and the congressional record, people, they leave you alone. It's also, because it's safe, right? The rules are safe. So let's stay with them. The integrity of the existing bottom-up electoral system is intact and should be buttressed with state legislative action using the state HAVA plan system. All right, if there's any legislators in, let, are there legislators in the room? If there aren't, there should be. We got one? Oh, okay, good. Oh, <laughs> great, okay, the, the, the state system, we should just use the existing HAVA system and buttress it. That's the solution. That's the solution. Don't, get, don't, don't, don't tinker with the other stuff. Use the existing system because when you start opening up the discussion, that's when the progressives get in and do their mischief. So let's use the existing system, right? Number three, opportunities for improve, infusion of private funding or elect, external influence of electoral officials should be highly regulated or eliminated altogether. Opportunities for infusion of private funding or external influence of electoral officials should be highly regulated or, or limited. We, let's do away with it before 2024. Do away with it. Let's put in the systems to make sure the public money flows, flows to the clerks. Let's give them what they need, but let's, let's not allow private money, public-private partnerships. That's where the current battle is, right? Public private partnerships. Those are bad words in my mind, okay? Um, so, somebody wants to clap. I'll, I'll take that. Okay, I'm almost finished. Um, <clears throat> uh, the built-in HAVA disincentives, um, the built-in HAVA disincentives to management and purging of voter rolls should be investigated and eliminated. Okay, here's one of the problems with the HAVA system that need to be fixed is that HAVA has disincentives for clerk, county clerks, especially in rural areas, to go in and purge voter rolls because they get money per voter on the roll. Got it? That's how HAVA allocates monies to local clerks. And so what we want to do is we want to go in and purge. That's why they don't purge those rolls. And so we want some other incentive system at the local level that, that di or disincentive to not purge the voter roll. That's huge, right? We had a lot of dead voters voting twice. Not just once. They got back up and they went and voted again. <laughs> it's a problem. Okay, strict electronic machine. Here we go. Strict electronic machine logs. Original ballot and, uh, and other audit trails should be employed along with support at the state and local levels. Let's support our cl clerks at the local levels. Let's bring it back home. Let's have machine audits. Let's have legislation that actually requires the internal of that machine to be audited. 
and it reside we have to keep it for one whole election cycle All right let's do it it's it, we can do that okay state by state vote oh sorry state by state voter information and record keeping systems should be considered critical infrastructure All right state by state voter information data and record keeping systems should be considered critical infrastructure electronically segregated and safeguarded at the state level right Kansas, Kansas cannot release information to Nebraska or to Eric or to anybody else. And that will remove the incentive to go after the information. Got a state law? It's safeguarded. And I didn't put it in here because I didn't have time. But what I wanted to do is have somebody behind bars. Right? We don't... Oh, you want me behind bars? It's probably not... It's probably going to happen, but but we need strict we need we need strict laws, criminal laws, I think, about interference with elections. Yep. Uh, question and answer. Okay, here we go. Okay. Do package our members first, please keep. Be the only company I know of in read his, his things are Tom, Tom, uh, uh, not, not, now it's Tom something, he has uh, a large firm of attorneys that have uncovered, you know, Hillary's emails and so forth, but he's challenged and sues various states for not cleaning up their rules, but there needs to be, we need to have more companies doing that. I think isn't that the voter integrity pro project? Judicial, yeah, Judicial Watch is doing that, um, and that go that goes back to organization. That goes back to being smart about what we do. That goes back to think tanks. And conservatives really, you know, one of the reasons I'm going to say this: one of the reasons we lose is we're doing the same things the same way over and over and over and not very many people are doing this organizing around it putting think, ta think tanks together uh, and, and, and one of the problems is, is that we get together and then we start fighting right now the progressives they fight too but after they've beat up the conservatives so let's not let's let's organize let's pull leadership together and let's make let's make it work next question the voter database access who who do you think should be limited to that data he the questions on the table who should be limited to that data what data oh, the registered voter database register okay registered voter database um, the in, and I'll use Pennsylvania as an example because Pennsylvania, see this is where we start getting into the weeds. Pennsylvania Secretary Bachvar is a real bad actor. She sits on the board of Rock the Vote. She signed contracts with Rock the Vote and actually allowed access and upload from the field to state databases, right? Pennsylvania. Now, your question to your question is who should who should be allowed? I think you should have the DMV system. The DMV systems typically are merged with the state voter system, right? Because you can go in and register to vote at DMV, right? The integrity of the system is fairly intact because the progressives haven't been able to crack it. So something's going on, right? The system's working. So to answer your question, I think that that certainly the secretary's office right by the way we need to pick our secretaries very very careful we need to watch that in every state of the union where who are the secretaries who are the candidates where are they coming from who how are they funded but to answer your question I think that it needs to be very very carefully guarded and then and then cybersecurity so I'm not being specific because there's a lot of there's a lot of answers but I do think that these people should be vetted they should have cybersecurity training maybe you know maybe have some kind of clearances I don't know but it's it's important now data we're in the age of da data right now now just comment on that is that I used to like you googled Carlson and you couldn't 
find anything. And I was okay with that. <laughs> now you Google me and all the stuff that I do, like including that last pachyderm, Google has it all laid out. But they don't include my reports. I'm sure that's by accident. <laughs> I'm curious about the, I've never heard about $800,000 in the Central County before. Who, who received it, the check? How was it used? And what was the negative impact of the uh, uh, illegitimate, illegitimacy of the election? I'll touch number one, I'll speak to number two, and I won't even go to number three because I don't understand it, how it was used. But who received it? Uh, the elections, admi the, the administrator of, of Sedgwick County applied for the grant and, and that, so that went into them. It was to be used for elections and I don't know how it was doled out. So that would be a FOIA request in Sedgwick County to say how did you spend the money. The commission, the, the Sedgwick County Commission knew about it because they, they um, at some level had to approve that grant. So, um, if, and so th that grant, flow, right? A million bucks doesn't just come through your county and you not notice it. Come on, all right? I mean, this doesn't pass the reasonable person test. Right here. Hey, Jim, um, so on the CTCL um, in the HAVA, they, they contradict each other, if I understand this right. Sometimes one is for voter integrity, the other one is for let's get our job done. Am I right? And the CTCL has clawbacks, so they can ask for their money back if they don't follow their rules. Does HAVA have the same thing? And can you lose your HAVA funding if you follow CTCL? Does that oh, okay, which question should I answer first? The, the black There's a whole bunch of them I want to well, answer. I'm sure I'm <laughs> what I understood before I the question. But okay. the HAVA and the CTCL, do they both have clawback? And HAVA funding being larger, I think, than the CTCL. Let me respond to that one first, Debbie. Um, have you ever seen the federal government take money back? Okay, someone said yes. All right, okay. Um, the answer is, is that here's something important. Each, each precinct that receives HAVA money is supposed to have an agreement with the state that they're gonna use that money for in accordance with the HAVA plan. So that's number one, right? So you need the agreements, you need the HAVA plans. Um, two is the, the uh, with respect to clawback, the um, I have not heard of the federal EAC. By the way, the way this works is the Congress appro appropriates money, it goes down to the EAC, which is a non-regulatory body at the federal level, and then that again do doles out the HAVA money to the states. That's the apparatus, and then the money is spread through the HAVA plans in accordance with the HAVA plans through the Secretary's office, and that's typically an administrative body. Okay, that's how the, that's how the money flows. But the um, I, I have not seen the money drawn or clawed back. Now she's talking about CTCL. There, there was language in their in their um, in their contracts that said we can we can pull some or all of that money back at will. And so we raised that issue, and and it didn't get a lot of airplay. But let me explain. Let me unpack that for you. The importance of it is that if let's say let's use Sedgwick County for example, they're eight hundred and sixteen thousand um, dollars. CTCL by contract could actually reach into Sedgwick County and say we want that money back. You didn't use it right. Now, if you think about that from a from an administrator standpoint, now this affects your future budgets, and and in smaller counties it can affect your bonds and insurance. So we raised that issue. It didn't get a lot of airplay, but it should. Now I know the clerks at the local level that read this probably scared the daylights out of them. Because they said, well this could affect our bonds. Right? So, um, so anyway, how's that? Does that, okay, let's get, take another question here. No? Uh, I would like to know if you were recommending people to donate to this position watch. Could you give us a list that you would put from the top down? Of, of uh, I, you know. Um, Small donation to Judicial Watch, and they can provide some very accurate and follow-up information as well as you would post to the top Okay. There's, you know, I'm, I, you're creating tension for me, sir. 
Well, I think it'd be a good question. Uh, because, I'll, let me tell you why, well, let me explain why, is that um, whenever someone wants to give money, that should get attention to the guy at the podium. But on the other hand, my, my response to you is do your homework. Figure out who you want to give to. Right? You heard some great, great name brands here, and I'm not dinging you. Please don't hear that. But I, I'm saying that, that this is part of we as Americans have to take control of things. We as conservatives have to, have to buck up and do our, do our own re, our homework and give money to. So Thomas More Society is a good one. Amistad Project is a good one. Uh, Judicial Watch. Someone name some others. I, I trust people in this room. Is defending freedom. What's that? Is it the Alliance for Defending Freedom? Is that... Lines for defending freedom. Yeah, yeah, and and so look into look into here's and here's one of the things I'll just I'll crack this I'll give you a peek behind the curtain. Is I'm starting a national nonprofit, and one of the objectives of that national nonprofit will be to t get money from billionaires and get it down to the street. That's our people on the street are starving, because it's in conservative circles. Now this may sting. In conservative circles, what do we do? We fund associations at the state level, and then the money, do, and, and it pays for salaries, and it doesn't get down to the people on the street. And that's where the problem is. We got to get money down to the doers. Oh, man, we got a legislature standing up, standing up with writings. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm just a poor retired guy. Um, so on your chart, you've got a, a dotted line here between advocacy and policy. And can you kind of explain how that dotted line? Yeah, is? love to. Is that the question? Yes, sir. Unpack a little bit more. Okay, let's see. We're at twelve fifty nine. So if anyone needs to leave, um, please feel free. Um, the uh, if you, uh, but here we go. Um, the uh, there uh, there's a dotted line ad advocacy and policy and what that is this okay the way this apparatus is set up you have the foundations that are funding and then you have the the circles and the squares at the policy level I explained those now you go to the next tier down and by the way this t this lower tier does not even begin to scratch the surface on what's out there mm -hmm. Okay, and what's out there is this, is the advocacy is your Pennsylvania voice, your rock the vote, your turbo vote. Now, now, now you're probably not going to sleep for a couple of days on this, but the way these people work is they, well, there's a couple of things. They collect information from, um, they collect information from younger people who want to sign up to vote. That's good, but they actually aggregate it. If you're like me, okay, let's, let's use a scenario. Let's say I go to University of Kansas, right? C good conservative school. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so, uh, well, anyway, uh, okay, K-State, a kind of conservative school. So I, I go there, and, I, and I'm a student, and I want to learn to vote, or I want to learn to vote. I want to I wanna vote, and so we would find Kansas Voice. I don't know if there's one or not, but these nonprofits are set up through all the states. Remember, they're shell companies. They're set up, and they're, they're put here, and they have the same actors floating back and forth. Right, all these shell nonprofits. So I go in, and and uh, I go in, and, and they, ha uh, they they have these things in the student union, you know, and and they have representatives there that say, okay, Carl, you know, vote, and or here's how you vote. And so I go there, and and uh, they say, okay, um, here's our website, and you can either click on the bar that says, I don't know anything, tell me what I need to know, or the bar that says, take me to the Secretary of State office. Right? I always click the I don't know anything bar, or I used to. You click on that bar, and then it collects information from you. And then that information is stored. That you you now are part in a third party um, uh, voting uh, voting uh, database that, that that information rolls up to all these other people, and then they send me text messages on this on congressmen that are a problem or car or, or congresswomen or even now down to the local level. They monitor. This is very sophisticated, guys. Very sophisticated. And so the, 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 to, an, to answer your question is advocacy below, policy above. And so this is on the ground, affecting voting on the ground. Okay? It's on the ground. It's grassroots, grassroots level. Last question. Last question. How much can our uh, current voting machines be manipulated? Um, that's, a, that's a dominion question. That's a voting, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a dominion question. 
and there's a there's a lot of good information out there but I'm going to dodge that question um, the, we, we have we, we know we have knowledge about it but we're not ready to go there Mr. Jim Carlson. 